Welcome back to Think Tech. This is Keeping the World Company. I'm Jay Fidel, and uh, the handsome young man is Tim Apicella. Welcome, Tim. Good morning, Jay. Thank you for that compliment. I we're going to talk up. about we're going to talk about Congress and Ukraine. You know, and it's been you know sort of peeking out the edges that the Republicans don't like to support Ukraine. We'll, we'll something here, we'll something there, and uh, after a while, you get the idea that there's a kind of movement in Congress to not support Ukraine. Uh, although Heather Cox Richardson said it was strong views to, to support Ukraine, I'm not so sure about that because it keeps popping its little head out. And uh, it certainly popped its head out um, when they had the continuing resolution a couple of days ago to fund the government. And there were people apparently on both sides of the aisle that, uh, that worked to exclude uh, aid to Ukraine from that continuing resolution, uh, which I thought was also a, an indication as there were an, an increasing number of people in Congress, especially the House, um, that don't want to support Ukraine. So my question to you is, my first question, there are many questions, but why is it important that we support Ukraine? Maybe they're right. No, they're not right. No, it's critical that we we support Ukraine. I mean, you just have to be a student of history to know that you have an unchecked dictator that has um, desires to land grab and uh, in, in the case of Putin, he wants to, he's, you know, he's the reincarnation of Peter the Great, and he has great desires to uh, reclaim all the Russian satellite states in Eastern Europe to be once again the great Soviet Union, but not call it the Soviet Union. Uh, so just, you know, just know your history that dictators, if they're, they go unchecked and there is a, um, a movement of being passive or, or, or try to... Um, work with the devil, so to speak, uh, it doesn't go well. Uh, Chamberlain comes to mind. The prime minister for England tried to be passive and, and work with Hitler. Well, look what that got him. All right. So uh, I don't think Putin's any different than a Hitler. And uh, it's paramount that we put Putin back in its box uh, from the start. Had that been done to Hitler on his move to Austria or certainly um, the, uh, the Blitzkrieg invasion of, of um, Poland, if we had put them in a box and contained them right then and there, maybe we could avoid, uh, you know, a whole world war. And I think Ukraine has that that recipe in the pot as a possibility that if, if Ukraine is lost, um, all the other states it, that surround Ukraine will be lost. And I think that we then get into um, World War Three with a potential um, United Nations Article Five, where one for all and all for one has to take place. And Poland would probably be the next target for Putin. So you mean, uh, NATO, you mean NATO article five for NATO? Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's what I meant. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's critical that we, we pay the money now because you could pay the money now. And right now it's about $70 billion or you could pay quadruple five times, 10 times that amount. Uh, when Putin has ga gathered strength and has taken over several com uh, countries in Europe. And now what do we do to extract them? Yeah, what do we do to keep American boots off the ground, too? That's part of it. That's part of a war. Um, the other thing is, uh, I want to ask you, instead of bleak in the first question, is, uh, you know, why is it important that the United States support Ukraine? I mean, can't those people in Europe support Ukraine, the East, you know, EU and NATO? Well, you know, um, contrary to Donald Trump, we need to be engaged in world politics, world economy. Uh, it's a smaller world now, and uh, isolationism is a, a thing of the past, or it should have been. Uh, we should have learned our lessons in World War One and World War Two that uh, you just can't, you know, hide in the corner and pretend things are going to go well. Um, you have to intercede proactively, and I think the United Nations uh, is part of that, and the EU is uh, our economic cooperation with the EU, and certainly with NATO. Um, we have to be engaged in world in the world events. And um, Trump would have us do otherwise. And guess what? It won't go well for us. And we'll be in a major world conflict if we decide to sit back and twiddle our thumbs. You mentioned Trump a couple of times here. How much is he involved in this um, devolution of Congress against Ukraine? Is he running the show on that issue? Well, he's the Pied Piper of the MAGA movement, is he not? Uh, it's not a matter of policy with the MAGA. And, of course, that spills over into the normal GOP, which I used to call the normal GOP. 
uh, or the non-mega GOP. Um, he's the Pied Piper. Whatever Donald wants goes. Whether there's any rationality or not is not the issue. Uh, Donald is the cult leader of the MAGA movement, and uh, whatever he says goes. And whether it's a horrible policy idea or not is irrelevant. Uh, Donald Trump is set on ca causing chaos in the world. And certainly um, Ukraine is on his list of, of countries not to support. Why? Because, quite frankly, he really wants Putin to succeed. He loves Putin. He really does. And if, if the GOP can't see that, and they're just following like lemons behind them, and now are Putin supporters, and uh, they're, they're opposed to helping Ukraine, what does that say about their patriotism to democracy, world democracy, and keeping Europe free of, uh, of tyranny and uh, dictatorships? Yeah, I, I remember there was a really strange moment where Trump, not too long ago, where Trump said, if I'm reelected, uh, Vladimir, I'm going to I'm going to give you Ukraine on the first day. And um, so he has, uh, you know, lots of motivation on this specific issue. It's not just that he wants to destroy the world. He wants for some transactional reason. He wants to satisfy Vladimir Putin. And he's been open about that. And I make the assumption, you know, on a logical basis, a deductive basis, that it's it's um, it's part of his program. And his program is what the Republicans, the MAGA Republicans in, in the House anyway, are following. Um, so what, what you have is uh, they're all responding to him on, uh, on a cult basis. But let me ask you one, one more question, and, and that is, um, can, can they do it without us in terms of providing the money? Um, can the EU and NATO do it without us and providing the money and the weapons do they have the resources? And finally, do they have the political will? Would our departure off the stage on this issue just um, deflate the whole program? Would they stop caring as much? It's two parts to that question. Yeah, let me take your second part first. Um, they can't afford not to care. They can't afford to have a, another world war on the doorstep of Europe. They They are students of history. Europe is... European leaders and and their constituents know very well what war, World War II did to them and, and destroyed an entire continent. And um, they can't afford that, and they know they can't afford that. So they have to be proactive. And yes, you know, they have limited resources. Their GMPs are all different, uh, one country from another. I'll just go down a quick list uh, that I pulled off here today. The United States from January 22 to May 31st, 2023, We've contributed or have set aside $70.7 .7 billion. The next in line is the EU, uh, $35 billion. The United Kingdom at $10.74 billion. Germany at $10.68 billion. Japan, $6.6 .6 billion. Japan is helping. I didn't know that. Canada, $5.27 billion. The Netherlands goes down to $4 billion. Norway, $2 billion. Denmark, almost $2 billion. Sweden, 1.8 billion, France 1.47. Come on, France, you can do better than that. And Italy, and I know Italy could do better. 1.34 billion dollars have been contributed from January 2022 to May 31st, 2023. Not bad. So if our 70 billion dollars went away, uh, could they increase theirs uh, as a percentage of their GMP? Yeah, they're going to feel the pain on their economy, uh, but. The answer is yes. I think it will continue and it would increase. The Europeans would have to increase their contributions to Ukraine to keep them in the fight. Big question is, if they didn't and if we didn't, what would happen? You know, one of the things I noticed in looking at this is that um, Ukraine lives on a moment to moment basis, like a cash basis. If they don't get weapons um, just in time, they're out of ammunition, um, and their war effort, you know, is greatly jeopardized. So it, it's it's only a matter of weeks. There are some people that speculate that uh, they're going to run out of gas very soon in the absence of American support and in the absence of, you know, European support replacing the American support. And all of a sudden, they won't have weapons to fight. And this is a war of weapons, more than men and women. It's a war of weapons, and it's a war of technology, which is expensive. Um, and so, query, what happens 
to the war effort if the Europeans, you know, don't belly up, as you suggest. Putin succeeds. He overruns Ukraine. He sets up his puppet governments. That in, in, in coordination with Belarus and you know, just he take over all the satellite. Again, they become satellite nations of Russia with um, puppet dictatorships. And um, Putin is right where he wants to be as Peter the Great incarnated. You know, when this first started out, we, we, we all thought, and maybe Putin misled us to think that he was only after Ukraine. But over the past few months, it's, it's, uh, at first it appeared that he was after the Baltics too. You know, Estonia, Latvia, for that matter, Poland, Lithuania, those places are really scared because it's not just that he's looking at them and, and, and you know, making, making face at them. Um, and he's actually doing things. He's uh, hacking them. Uh, he's doing espionage on them. He's trying to turn people, turn public opinion with uh, television messaging and social media messaging uh, against their people. He's trying to have their people turn around and say, we should support Russia. And, you know, and after all this time, it seems like that does have an effect. But, but you know, it seems to me that it's not just the Baltics. It's the Balkans. And that's most recently, in, you know, he, he owns, uh, just as he owns uh, Belarus, he owns Transnistria, which is on his border. Um, he owns Moldova, which is just on the other side. He's um, active in Romania. Um, he's looking at the, at the, Bal the Balkans, too. It's really interesting how he's trying to create the Warsaw Pact all over again and, and uh, Russianize, communize uh, all of the countries that were there before. And you can see it now. You know, before it was not so visible. Now you can see it. And if I were living in any of those countries, I'd be terrified. If I were living in Western Europe, I'd be terrified. And you're right. France and Italy, they're not really s supplying enough support. So this is really a time of crisis because now, you know, the mask is off and we get to see what Putin wants and what he's doing under the hood. But let me go to another thing. Let me well, let me just mention something based on your comment. Yeah. Um, look at the signs. Sometimes signs are a valid indicator of what's happening or what could happen. You've had a country that has been neutral for, for many, many years. Uh, didn't want to stick their, their toes in the water about conflicts and uh, Sweden and Finland now are part of going to be part of NATO or are not part of NATO. Uh, you have never would have expected that. I mean, I'm sure Putin certainly didn't expect it and uh, talking about blowing up in his face. I hope it all blows up in his face, but I'm not sure that it will because he's a busy boy. You know, he's trying to gain influence in all these countries. Uh, as we have discussed before, he's uh, distributing Russian flags and all over Africa. And it, it's, um, you know, it's it, it make, making Russia a favorite for a lot of those sub-Saharan countries. Why? I don't know. But, um, you know, you can sell anything with propaganda. You can sell the Brooklyn Bridge. You can sell Russia's aggression. It's really remarkable. And he's doing it in this country, too. I am sure to a moral certainty that he is also using his internet research agency uh, in Moscow, using you know hacking techniques uh, to work social media and convince people in the United States that Russia is really the good guy here. Well, I, I think what he, I think what he does is he 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 has special code language, if you will, like Donald Trump has. I mean, it's stochastic speech. It's it's uh, implied speech, if you will, for a certain desired goal. And I think Putin communicates through stochastic propaganda speech to his uh, his loyal follower, Donald Trump. And then, of course, Donald Trump has his following. So you almost have a direct line from Putin to the MAGA GOP. Uh, Trump is the interpreter, if you will. That's my opinion, because uh, whatever Trump says goes and whatever Putin wants, Trump is more than happy to comply. Yeah, and what's worse is that the... Um... The three big uh, social media companies in this country, which are actually global, uh, have all dropped off their monitoring systems. Um, you know, formerly Twitter, X, now Elon Musk. Uh, he didn't have a monitor. He fired everybody. 
Um, and you have uh, Facebook uh, with Mark Zuckerberg. They're not doing monitoring anymore. No, nobody is requiring them to do monitoring. And the same thing with Google. So, I mean, these, you know, mega corporations, billions and billions of dollars, um, they're letting it all in. So you can make outrageous statements and conspiracy theories. You can say black is white and white is black, and nobody will stop you. This is really extraordinary. And it will lend, um, you know, lend fire uh, to Putin's claims that he's spreading on American social media. But let me go to one other thing, and it's, it's Joe Biden. You know, at the beginning of this, he was reluctant to send fighters to Ukraine. And he was reluctant to do the things that Ukraine wanted him to do. In retrospect, um, that kind of um, reluctance really was not the right thing um, because Russia took advantage of it. And after all, they had attacked their neighbor. They were involved in, you know, Nazi-like aggression uh, leading to World War II, you mentioned. The whole thing about the Blitzkrieg, that's what it was. That's what Putin was trying to do, a blitzkrieg. And we were not responding with the weapons that we needed. They were bombing, you know, all these uh, institutional and residential and, uh, you know, uh, power players and like, just flattening Ukraine. And, and Ukraine had no way to deal with that. Well, things, things are a little better now, but it, it, it does suggest that as an irony, uh, just as you say in the case of um, Munich and Chamberlain, um, had we responded immediately with appropriate weapons of force and rhetoric, uh, we'd be better off today. Putin wouldn't have gotten as far as he has got. But there are people, and I keep thinking of Mark Hamlin, you know, of Star Wars, who collects money for, for drones. And some of that money must be going to drones that are very useful because drones have become much more weaponized than just surveillance these days. Um, I keep thinking, you know, that maybe maybe the Ukraine, Ukrainians have a, a chance. But what is ironic is that we probably could have done a better job had we got into this at the beginning. And you and I talked about it many times, and I don't know why Biden was so passive. Well, here's the irony. I, irony of this whole thing is um, Biden was very slow to drag his feet. I I suppose one of his rationale was that uh, he didn't want to you know accelerate into a World War III. Um, that's why he's been reluctant to give them uh, long range missiles that can go into the Russia border. Uh, but you know it's funny because his reluctance to give Ukraine what it needed right then and there um, plays into why interest to support. Ukraine, uh, one of the major issues is impatience on the American public. They're impatient. This thing has gone on a lot longer. And remember, the expectations of the American public has been uh, truncated, accelerated due to technologies. We're just not a patient nation anymore. We want to see action and we want to see results uh, faster than ever before. And we expect these things. So this uh, dragging on of the Ukrainian war that Putin started uh, is going on too long for, for Americans. Let me just back that up a little bit. The uh, Brookings Institute came up with some information, some data. 26% um, back um, in the early days felt that Ukraine needed to be um, needed to be supported and we would do so with one or two years. And all that's changed now. Um, that's That's fallen down to 18%. Uh, other things that cause uh, interest here to change and wane is uh, the GOP at 51% back in March of 2022 felt that Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine was a threat to the United States interest. And that was March of 2022. Now, we, and the Dems at that time felt it was 50%. Now, um, that has fallen in January 2023. Now, this according to Pew Research. Um, that number has fallen for the GOP down to 29%. So from 51 to 29, and the Democrats, believe it or not, have gone from 50% down to 38% that um, the invasion is a threat to U.S. interests. Yeah, that reminds me that uh, one of the people involved in the funding resolution that excluded aid to Ukraine was AOC. We can never forget that there are some people on the Democratic side of the aisle who don't like Ukraine either. 
Um, I, I find that extraordinary that they can't get their act together and they don't see the global picture. Um, well, they and, see the finite picture, unfortunately. And, and what is that? Um, you know, reports of, of corruption, certain high uh, officials in Ukraine have uh, attempted to, you know, take away with some of the money. Um, these kind of stories don't help the national picture, the big picture, and that is support Ukraine is essential for a free Europe and eventually for the United States. Absolutely. And to, 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 add, to add to that uh, thought about AOC is that Jim Jordan is one of the front runners or the successor speaker. He's the worst possible choice. He's an idiot. It's not going to happen, Jay. Okay, I hope, I hope not because he doesn't like Ukraine either. Yeah, no, he doesn't. Uh, it won't happen because remember Danny Hassert? Yep. The Speaker of the House, and yep. he left the office in shame because he is a pedophile. Well, Jim Jordan was a wrestling coach, and he had full knowledge that the doctor that was treating uh, or looking at uh, wrestlers, I think the University of Michigan, I may have that the university wrong, uh, he turned a blind eye to it. And uh, this, this swamp monster is going to come back to him, and it's going to prevent him from becoming the Speaker of the House. That's my prediction. He's, he's up to his neck in that allegation and uh, that debacle. That doesn't mean they won't elect him, Tim. Uh, they they want to, elect I, the strangest people. I don't think they want to. I don't think they want a speaker of the house that could be a potential uh, gave aid and comfort to a pedophile. I'm, I don't think that even even for the mega deplorable GOP, I I think that's beyond their reach. Well, can some say that Trump could never be elected as president because he's involved in you know four felony cases, uh, four indictments. Um, who is to say whether that was to say still you you got me on that one Jay I give up <laughs> I went, right well maybe we all have to give up but here um so the, you know the the question is what does Biden do now this is an irony in the fact that he was passive before and now he's caught because there has emerged around him uh may I use the term swamp of alligators who don't want him to give any aid to Ukraine um, so he's kind of stuck where he couldn't have done it before. Um, and he had the opportunity. He had the support, just as you said. Now he doesn't have the support. And, um, you know, I'm really not sure what Congress will do if this is placed squarely in front of them. You know, he has this idea that in the next 45 days, you know, before the, the next funding crisis, uh, he will go to Congress and ask them for a special appropriation just for Ukraine. And I say, lots of luck, uh, Joe. Um, that's probably not going to happen. My guess is there isn't enough support in Congress to pass a bill like that. And he doesn't have the influence. So can, do you agree, by the way? No. I, I, unfortunately, I don't agree with you on this point. Uh, remember, the House of Representatives, the, the, the GOP wing of the House of Representatives, is controlled by the tail that wags the dog. And that tail consists of about 20 mega GOP. Uh, the rest of the Republicans, I don't believe they're, they're mega. And their support for Ukraine is still high. Um, I, I think that the Republicans on this particular issue will have bipartisan support, as it has in the, as the previous votes. I mean, we're up to $70 billion worth of aid to Ukraine. Uh, that wasn't done to, by the Democrats alone. That was a bipartisan support to get those bills passed, uh, that funding passed. So I don't think it's going to be any different. I think um, the Democrats will ask for a Republican bipartisan support, and I personally believe they'll get it. Um, the unfortunate part with this last round was the Democrats had to make a decision between um, taking it out and having the government um, taking it out and have the government stay open or insist that the funding take place and shut the government down. And the Democrats didn't want to own that position. So now that that's been temporarily delayed for 45 days, uh, I think what we'll see is uh, some earnest across the aisle um, horse training, if you will, of, of positions and policies and whatever Congress has, does when they do their horse trading. And I think you'll see this bill passed for Ukraine. I don't know if it's going to be the high dollar amounts that we've seen in the past, I think probably the number will be reduced, but at least you're going to see continued support from the United States in the form of um, warfare and non-kinetic non 
uh, support uh, for, for Ukraine's aid? Well, for all the reasons we've discussed, time is of the essence, and uh, Joe Biden ought to get on, get on with it. He's got to get a bill in there, and he's got to lobby for that bill, and he's got to count votes and make it happen. Um, it's not, by no means, is it a guarantee. The other thing that I find most interesting and probably the largest irony in this whole affair is his interim move about giving Iranian weapons, including Iranian drones, which they're good at that, um, to Ukraine, because somehow the United States has... Aiken achieved a stockpile of Iranian weapons, guns, ammunition, and drones. And Joe Biden... Who has? The United States? The United States. And Joe Biden has control of that, of that ammunition and guns and what have you, and he has the power to give it without congressional approval. He is the commander-in-chief. And so the next thing that he, is, that he could consider is considering is considering and probably will do is give that stuff and the iranians must be hopping up and down about this um give that stuff to ukraine i'm not sure they use the same you know size of ammunition or whether they can use all this but that that was um, you know in, in a cnn interview this morning i, I so, had no idea the united states had this cache of, of weaponry from that's iranian i don't know how they how they did that they did. Yeah, interesting. Well, you know, it kind of reminds me of um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt when um, the United States was clearly locked in its isolationist um, mentality. And what did he do? Uh, he lent military equipment, and he couldn't give he couldn't ship the tanks directly from the United States to England, but he just crossed it across the border to Canada. Then Canada was the the giver of of the weaponry to England. So it was a it was a it was a weapon lease program. I, there's a formal name for it, and I, I yeah, it lend right lease. now. Lend lease. Yeah, lease. Yeah, yeah. and um, that seemed to at least keep England in the battle and from going under. And it, had it not been for Franklin to do that, I, I think world history as we know it would have been different. We all probably be speak, speaking Deutsch. Well, good for Roosevelt. It really made a huge difference to the Allies. It, uh, it changed things as far as the, what do you want to call it, the leverage of, of, the, of the UK is concerned. And now this, this may be a significant um, move, and it is reminiscent. It does echo um, on, on Lendley's, except he would just give it to him. Um, and, and the world would be encouraged by that. Suffice to say, this is all in play right now. It's fluid. Uh, who knows what will happen in Congress? Who knows uh, who the speaker will be and what he will do or she? Um, who, who knows how the, the Democratic Party uh, will form up and the Republican Party uh, to get weapons and money? Uh, you, know, you can't be sure of what would happen in 45 days in a Congress that is increasingly chaotic. And who knows what will happen in Europe? Um, so it's a war of attrition. And it's a war of divide your your enemy. And so far, I'm not impressed with the way we have prosecuted our end of it. But who knows? Maybe this will so, somehow motivate us. Your final thoughts, Tim? My final thoughts is that President Biden needs to use the bully pulpit more effectively for two things. One is convince the American public that um, our, our pending election in 2024 is a, an issue of democracy the the continuation of the republic and maintenance of the rule of law that's one two is to make a clear distinction of the importance of of supporting ukraine uh despite what donald trump wants and despite what the mega gop wants to follow of, of trump's thoughts um and make it almost an issue of national importance he's not done a good enough job doing that he's done okay but he hasn't done good enough and in my mind that's what he needs to focus his energies on uh, certainly in the next 45 days. We'll be watching him with our hearts and our throats. Thank you so much, uh, Tim Epicella. This is Keeping the World Company on ThinkTech. Aloha.